वेलकम स्टूडेंट्स टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम डॉक्टर के एस नागराज ऑफ डेकन कॉलेज पुणे टीचिंग यू द कोर्स ऑफ हिस्टोरिकल लिंग्विस्टिक्स इन टूडेज मॉड्यूल वील बी डिस्कसिंग द कैरेक्टरिस्टिक फ्यूचर्स ऑफ आशो एशियाटिक लैंग्वेजेस इन द प्रीवियस मॉड्यूल वी लुक एट द सम ऑफ द एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ आशो एशियाटिक लैंग्वेजेस फ्रॉम द डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू from the history point of view and the population size point of view today we look at the characteristic features which is a very important area when we look at the characteristic features of these languages we are struck by the fact that there are two major subgroups and uh, so there are lots of differences between the between them munda and montkmer munda languages because they are spoken in india and uh, as you already know that there are other language families in this uh, neighborhood so the munda languages are influenced extensively by those languages uh, because of that they have changed quite a bit and today the munda languages have subject object verb order similar to in dravidian or indo-aryan whereas the monkmer languages have a different word order subject verb object so that the, there's a major change between them so in this particular module we we'll look at uh, these aspects in some detail in order to make general statements about the phonology of austroasiatic languages it is necessary to exclude munda and vietnamese which have which having been under the influence of indian and chinese languages respectively have acquired very different characteristics the usual austroasiatic word structure consists of a major syllable sometimes preceded by one or more minor syllables a minor syllable has one consonant and one minor vowel most languages have only one type of minor vowel or sometimes three for example a e or u others may also have vocalic nasal sounds which are produced by releasing the breath stream through the nose or liquids la and r as minor vowels major syllables are composed of one or two consonants followed by one major vowel and usually one final consonant in order to generalize the characteristic features we may take up first of all features shared by the both the branches that means both munda and montkmer because uh, munda is influenced by the indo-aryan and dravidian and montkmer is influenced by to some extent by chinese and other languages non austroasiatic languages therefore we have to first uh, uh, look at the common features then look at the munda and the montkmer features separately so here a phonetic feature of nearly all austroasiatic languages is the non release of final stops to be sure this is a phonetic norm across language families in the south asia but it stands out as a characteristic feature of mon khmer and munda languages in the indian linguistic area the non release in the final position is the future then in phonology both munda and mon khmer have complete sets of stops and nasals in non in in the root final position in four places of articulation that is velar palatal alveolar and labial so in mon khmer but not necessarily in munda this position coincides with the end of the word there is a dearth of spirants in the modern languages typically only sir is found in munda and sa and her in montkmer 
the canonical root forms of Proto-Austroasiatic excludes final clusters but requires at least one final consonant. Many modern languages have relaxed this rule by losing final glottal stop, thus allowing final open syllables. There is a great variety and frequency of consonant sequences were initially. Attempts notably by Schmidt in 1907 to analyze complex initials as necessarily containing affixes, leaving only a single initial consonant per root are no longer convincing. Many of the purported affixes have no clearly recurrent meaning or any other justifications. Morphologically, the nominalizing ne suffix infix is found in most Austroasiatic languages, though it is much less common in Munda than in the rest of the family. The same is true of the causative labial prefix. Both these features are also old in Austro Austronesian. This, among other things, led Schmidt to propose an Austric superstock which included Austroasiatic and Austronesian. Also common to Montkmaer and Munda is the presence of a basic lexical class called expressives. Edward like but without predicative force, these words are similar in some ways to African idiophones. They rely primarily on iconic means to evoke sensations of all kinds, especially in the domain of visual patterns. Their rich morphology is made of iconic diagrams, for example, partial duplications, substitutions, infix copying, and systematic distortions, often akin to deliberate language games. So that way, as you can see, the common features are not many, but as the comparative studies are progressing, hopefully more common features will emerge uh, in time. Now we look at uh, the, some of the features of Montkmaer subbranch. Is the, the major feature of Montkmaer languages is the presence of fixed ultimate syllable stress and the absence of suffixation. Apparent suffixes found in Nicobaris, some Aslian languages, and uh, modern sp spoken Mon are, are better described as phrase final critics. These two features stand apart for these languages. In fact, these few, two features coincide uh, to make what is known as a major syllable, and that is the richest part of the world. This is an aerial feature again of mainland Southeast Asian languages. The non-final minor syllables have a poor consonant inventory as well as a vocalism which is reduced to a single possible vowel except in Katuk and Aslian where three or four different vowels are possible in this position. Most languages allow only one minor syllable to precede the major syllable, giving rise to a distinct language type term sesquisyllable. This is typologically halfway between the monosyllabic languages to the north and west of Mount Khmer and the disyllabic or polysyllabic languages in the south and east. The most notable feature of Markme phonology is the large number of possible vowels in major syllables. The characteristic feature of the Austroasiatic languages is an extraordinary variety of major syllables. Systems of 30 to 35 different vowels are not uncommon. Systems are known with 5 degrees of height in the front, central and back series and systems with four are common. Diphthongized nuclei, broken vowels, and short vowels 
add to the inventory as nasalization and phonation types. All counted, 68 contrast to vocalic nuclei, probably a world record, have been claimed for one variety of a language called brew. Vowel systems with 20 or more units are not unusual. Phonological contrast in the phonation types of vowels termed voice register or simply register are also characteristic of Montmer languages. The most common is a two-way contrast of breathy versus clear phonation as in parok, mon, kui, bru, je, halang and certain dialects of western Khmer. However, three-way and even four-way register contrast as in chong have been recorded. Register can be accompanied by phonetic features of diphthongization, vowel height and pitch as well. Some languages, for example, Nyako, a variety of Mon language, appear to be in a transitional stage from register to tone and display both phenomena. Others, for example, Vietnamese are clearly tonal but have distinct phonations which are redundantly tied to certain tones. However, the Montmere family has far more register languages than tone languages. The latter include U, Bulung, and Vietnamese. Historically, the appearance of a breathy versus clear contrast in vowels is, is often the result of a devoicing of initial consonants, but there are other kinds of resistogenesis. It is even possible the proto austroasiatic had a creaky versus clear vowel contrast and was thus already a register language. The evolution of Mon Khmer registers is intimately tied to the history of the large vowel systems, which remains mostly unknown at present. In the looking at the vowels uh, and uh, other phenomena, uh, the Mon Khmer languages, at least some of them, have what is what are known as vocalic registers. Uh, interestingly, the surrounding languages like Chinese, uh, uh, Thai, have tones as distinctive, but Mon, which is spoken in the same area, is not a tonal language. But Mon is one of the important Mon Khmer languages along with Khmer. As in many Mon Khmer languages, Mon uses a vowel phonation or vowel register system in which the quality of voice in pronouncing the vowel is phonemic. There are two registers used in Mon. One is called clear voice, the other is called creaky voice or they are also called breathy voice. In a language called Bru of Katuik sub-branch, there are supposed to be 64 distinct vowels as stated above. That is unusual. However, a typical consonant system for an Austroasiatic language would be the following. There are five voiceless stops, Pata, Chaka, Glotter stop, Bada, Jaga. Then there are supposed to be two implosives, the four nasals, mana, nyanga, then the others, va, ra, la, sa, ya, ha. Some languages, for example, Pyrrhic, Samalaic, have an aspirated series of consonants in which, uh, like, pa, tha, cha, ka, for instance, uh, uh, Monic, Khmer, Peric, etc. The imploded sounds are found only in a few branches of Mon Khmer, for example, Mon Khmer Bahanarik, but it is possible that they existed in the ancient language which may be called Proto Mon Khmer. Pre glottalized nasals and liquids are also found sometimes as single distinctive sounds and sometimes as consonant clusters. In final position, 
All consonants except voice stops can be found, but in several languages, for example, Mon, Sadang, Palang, the number of possibilities is more reduced. Final stops are pronounced without release. Nasals are often decomposed. Palatal consonants Ch and Ny are commonly found at the end of words, a feature that sets Austroasiatic languages apart from the other languages of South Asia as already stated at the very beginning. Khmer has 21 consonants which can occur initially and 15 consonants which can occur finally. Coming to morphology, again we, we the, the Mon Khmer languages are more isolative in nature than Munda languages. In fact, uh, Munda is highly agglutinative in character and Vietnamese, interestingly, though of uh, Mon Khmer branch, has become an isolative language that means there is no morphology as such. So Munda languages have an extremely complex system of prefixes, infixes and suffixes. Verbs, for instance, are inflected for person, number, tense, negation, mood, definiteness, location, and agreement with the subobject. Furthermore, derivational processes indicate intransitive, causative, reciprocal, and reflexive forms. On the other hand, Vietnamese has practically no morphology. And all other Mon Khmer languages fall in between these two extremes. Between these two extremes, the other Austroasiatic languages have many common features. One, except, it, except in Nicobaris, there are no suffixes. A few languages have enclitics, certain elements attached to the end of noun phrases. Two, infixes and prefixes are common so that only the final vowel and consonant of a word remain untouched. It is rare to find more than one or two affixes, for example, prefixes or infixes attached to one root. Thus, because roots are mostly monosyllabic, the number of syllables per word remains very small. The same prefix or infix may have a wide number of functions depending on the noun or verb class to which it is added. Many affixes are found only in a few fossilized forms and have often lost their meaning. 5. Expressive language and wordplay are embodied in a special word class called expressives. These are sentence adver adverbials that describe noises, colors, light patterns, shapes, movements, sensations, emotions, aesthetic feelings, and so on. As I already said, the Mon Khmer languages are analytic in syntax, whereas uh, uh, Munda languages are agglutinative in that particular aspect. Historically, there is an evident tendency toward morphological simplification, an extreme example being Vietnamese. Its lexicon is basically monosyllabic and it relies upon word order and compounding to express grammatical functions. The vestiges of much more complicated morphology in Khmer, for example, suggest that in ancient time the system was much more elaborated. Syntactically, morphophonemic Mon Khmer languages have characteristics of typical of the southeastern linguistic area, such as subject, verb, object order, noun classifiers, serial verb constructions. Generally, Mon Khmer languages show a strong tendency to assimilate syntactically to their aerial neighbors. The more distant geographically and genetically, Munda languages are markedly different in many respects. Structurally, Mon Khmer languages tend to have sesquisyllabic word structure already stated above. Words may begin with clusters of three or even four consonants, but the set of possible word 
word foreigners is always much more restricted. The range of word, word shapes in a typical Mon Khmer language is illustrated with the following examples from Jru, a West Bahanaric language. CV, CVC, CCVC, CCVC, CCCVC. In sharp contrast with the situation in Munda, Mon Khmer morphology practically never indicates syntactic agreement except perhaps Khasi. This morphology is usually derivational and non-productive with a few exceptions, for instance, in the Australian branch. Its typical function is to change the grammatical class or subclass of the base to which it is attached, for example, from noun to verb, from intransitive to transitive and vice versa, or from mass noun to count noun. There is a great semantic variety of causative formations and nominalizations. The most original feature of the Mon Khmer family is the presence of a great number and variety of infixes. These consist of a nasal, a liquid or a simple vowel inserted immediately after the first consonant of the base. It would be tempting to see here the result of an ancient process of metathesis and resilbification from original prefix vocalic segments. However, there are examples of multiple infixation and at least one non-vocalic infix per would be difficult to explain in this way. Uh, in languages where expressives have been described, for example, Pacho, Khmu, Bahanar, Khasi, Samai, this word class displays a profusion of morphological patterns including different kinds of partial or modified reduplication, numerous substitutions of segments are possible and convey gradations of meaning especially with the many vowels available in such languages. In syntax, Mon Khmer languages consistently place the object after the verb, the possess after the possessor, the attribute after the noun and diacritics at the end of the noun phase, the group of properties which was identified by Schmidt in 1907 forms a coherent linguistic type found all over Southeast Asia. It is diametrically opposed to that found in the Munda languages and more generally in the Indian linguistic area. But when there is no object, several languages have the verb in first position. A few languages, for example, in the Wa group, do this for all sentence types, at least as an option. Some others have verb first as a basic order in certain constructions, but disguise it by proposing an apparent object, apparent subject. The place of the subject and with respect to the verb is not so neatly patterned. Most languages have the order yes, we, wo, when wo is expressed, agreeing in this, in this with, the, with the pattern of the dominant Thai family. Thus, in Khmer, what seems to be a yes, we, wo sentence uh, that is uh, is actually an intransitive construction with the verb in first position cheek bal that is heart plus head and knom i proposed as an apparent subject a closer translation would thus be my head hurts since no neighboring language family provides a model for this pattern there is a possibility that mon khmer languages were originally verb first at least as an option. Possessive and demonstrative forms and uh, relative clauses follow the head down. If particles are formed, they will be prepositions, not postpositions, and the normal word order is subject, verb, object. There is usually no copula equivalent to the English verb be. Irrigative constructions, for instance, uh, are not found in all the languages, but definitely found in some languages, like in Samai, 
uh, is possible and a few languages do but the Munda languages do not have this future. Also noteworthy are sentence final particles that indicate the opinion, the expectations etc. So when we look at uh, the morphology of uh, Munda languages, we see an elaborate demonstrative system in Santali, uh, Gita, etc. Number, gender, in, when, in case of gender, normally animate versus inanimate uh, distinction is found, direct versus lateral perception, sensory modality, visual versus the rest, particularizing emphasis and features relating to participants in the didactic scenario can be marked in one or both of these uh, systems. In addition, expressive features, that is stem vowel lengthening, reduplication and echoing are used in forums heavily marked for the features mentioned above. Munda languages differ radically from all other Austroasiatic languages in having complex morphology and complex syntax and in having basic subject object verb order rather than subject verb object word order. Uh, as, and it, this is this order is similar to the Dravidian and Indo-Aryan languages. The Munda languages use affixes extensively and are agglutinative in nature. Suffixes and particles placed after the noun are used to express such features as number, position. It is quite conceivable that the complexity of Munda morphology is a result of the historical change from an older SVO order to the present SOV order. The Munda verbs very different in this regard from Montkmer marks a variety of verbal categories of tense, aspect and mood. It's very interesting to note that when we come to vocabulary, the Munda languages because of the Indian influence have borrowed extensively from the dominant languages of the area and in process have lost a lot of their native vocabulary. Similarly, the Montkmer languages under the influence of the local languages have lost a lot of their own vocabulary and borrowed from them. So the composition of the vocabulary of the Australasiatic languages reflects their history. Vietnamese, Mon, Khmer, the best known languages of the family came within the orbit of larger civilizations and borrowed without restraint. Vietnamese from Chinese, Mon and Khmer from Sanskrit and Pali. At the same time, they have lost a large amount of their own Austroasiatic vocabulary. It is among isolated mountain and jungle groups that this vocabulary is best preserved, but which needs to be studied much more carefully and vigorously. But there, other disruptive forces are at work for instance, uh, uh, taboo is a major feature uh, which, uh, uh, is, which causes loss of native vocabulary and uh, further uh, replacements take place. In fact, the concept of taboo we have studied in uh, other uh, modules as well. Therefore, uh, I will not go into the details of it here. So, when we look at the writing systems, Two Austroasiatic languages have developed their own orthographic systems and use them even today. Both the scripts, the letters, shapes and principles of writing were borrowed from Indian alphabets, perhaps those of the Pallava Kingdom of South India that were in use in Southeast Asia at that time. Both Austroasiatic groups modified these alphabets in their own way to suit the complex morphology of their languages. The most ancient inscriptions extant are in Old Man, belonging to 6th, 7th century AD, soon followed by Old Khmer in the early 7th century. Interestingly, later on, Vietnamese uh, has developed its own writing in 17th century for the first time the tone of Vietnamese 
has been marked in writing. In fact, even today, it is employed. Probably there is the only language in the world where tone is marked in normal writing. So elsewhere, we don't find much of writing. However, in the present uh, uh, century, there have been various attempts to develop writing in some of the Munda languages like Santali, uh, Mundari, Ho, etc. Some native scripts like Old Chiki uh, have been created, but uh, they are yet to gain popularity. To summarize then, Asiatic languages hold an important place in the history and uh, uh, so it's necessary to study them carefully, elaborately and compare them with other language groups which will throw, which likely will throw light on the history of this particular subcontinent. Again, many of the languages, because they are tribal languages, they are not yet studied in detail. The, the need of the hour is to study them and produce good grammars and dictionaries of them and uh, hopefully prepare comparative works based on them. Then only we'll have a better understanding of the family. So we, there are uh, references available and uh, even in the internet one can get uh, more information on this particular family. Thank you.